Hello friend, welcome back to Acre Homestead. My name is Becky. If you are new, welcome to my kitchen. Today we're going to make something, two things I've never made before. Well, I shouldn't say that. I have attempted to make this one other time and I was probably 12 and I am in my 30s now, so it's been a while. We are gonna make, attempt to make some homemade bagels. I found a recipe online that has really good reviews. I'll link it down below. While this dough is rising, we are going to go downstairs and start taking care of some of the black beans that came out of the garden and take care of the potatoes. So we have a project to do while the dough rises. So I just put in one and a half cups of water and now I'm gonna put two and three fourths teaspoon of active dry yeast. And I have a half teaspoon here so I need to think about this. That's one. That's two teaspoons. And then we're gonna come up after we do our projects downstairs, we're gonna weigh our potatoes and we are going to see how many potatoes we grew last year or this year in the garden. And then once we do that and take care of the black beans, we're gonna see how many black beans we got this year as well. I need to measure out one tablespoon of brown sugar. Then we'll come up, we'll bake these bagels and we are gonna make some apple fritters for dessert. So we're gonna make some bagel sandwiches for dinner tonight with these bagels as long as they turn out well. And then we'll have enough for breakfast for the rest of the week. So then I just added my sugar, my yeast, my water. I'm gonna let that sit for a minute and then we will add our flour. Bread flour is something I now keep it in my kitchen all the time. I never used to keep this on hand and with all the bread baking I've been doing and recipe testing and all that stuff, I have noticed that bread flour really does make a big difference when making breads. Hence bread flour, bread flour has more gluten in it than all purpose flour. And this recipe does call for bread flour. Now we need four cups of bread flour or 520 grams of bread flour. So I'm gonna go ahead and weigh slash measure out my bread flour. I've got my bowl on a scale here. That right there is exactly 520 grams. And I'm gonna start whisking this together and then I'm gonna knead it by hand. It says it's gonna be a pretty stiff dough. I'm glad I decided to weigh this out instead of measure it because I would have used about a half cup more flour if I had used my measuring cup than use the scale. I don't usually pull the scale out, but lately I've been trying to do it more because I know you're gonna get a better product. Now, the last time I made these, I remember I was going through my mom's cookbook. I was bored one day. I'm gonna put a little bit of flour on my hands. And I remember looking at this one cookbook and it had a recipe for bagels. And I remember thinking, you can make bagels at home? I wanna try that. And that was probably one of the ways I got into cooking. And so I attempted to make them and they turned out horrible. They were dense and rubbery and not good. We ate them, but they were not good. They were not pillowy and chewy and what you think of. And I'm sure I didn't use bread flour. I'm sure I used all purpose flour because I probably just used whatever my mom had on hand. So we're going to give it another attempt today and see if we can do any better. It says we need to knead this until this dough becomes elastic -y about seven to 10 minutes. And it says this dough is gonna be pretty stiff and not to use a mixer, but I think this dough is not super stiff. I probably could have used my mixer. I don't wanna work in too much flour. Do you all have any recipes that were something you tried to make and you thought, you can't make that at home. You've got to buy that at the store. Bagels were probably one of my first ones. I think that is about perfect. It's nice and soft and bouncy. So we're gonna put this back in our bowl. I'm gonna put a little bit of oil on the tops just so it doesn't dry out. And then I have a warm towel, a warm damp towel. And we're gonna cover this and let this rise for an hour and a half. While that's rising, we're gonna head downstairs, shell the black beans and weigh the potatoes. I just grabbed some big bowls because I think we're gonna need these for the black beans. This here 
is the black bean harvest. Around it is the potato harvest. We've already eaten a lot of potatoes and we've already turned the potatoes into gnocchi. So this is not representative of all the potatoes <laughs> that were harvested this year, but it is a good representation. Probably we're missing probably about 30 pounds. So I need to go through and still check to see if there's any of the potatoes that I need to put into a pile that need to be eaten first. And then ones that I'm gonna stick in some longer term storage. And then here are the black beans we're gonna process in just a minute. Here I have some crates that I used last year. And this is what I'm going to put the potatoes in. I think what I should do is get a weight and figure out how much a crate weighs. And then I'm gonna fill it and then we'll weigh the crate. All right, the crate is four pounds. So now I'm just gonna start filling it with the russet potatoes that are beautiful. My scale is not working. So we are not gonna get a weight on these potatoes this year. That's fine. I'm not worried about it. Let's just get these potatoes taken care of and start working on the black beans then. My goal was to weigh these potatoes today, but I just didn't have it in me to try to get this scale to work. I probably fiddled with it for 10 minutes and then I said, you know what? <laughs> it's okay if I don't get a weight on these potatoes this year because we've already used quite a few of them and I don't have an accurate, I wouldn't have an accurate weight anyway. And so I probably could have, you know, gone and got new batteries or something, but the more important thing on this day was to manage these potatoes and get them into these crates and to get the black beans taken care of. Because this week I'm gonna be harvesting all the onions and I'm gonna bring them in down here to cure as well. And I didn't want to bring the onions in until I managed these potatoes. So that's what I decided was more important than trying to get a weight on these potatoes. Now I have got a couple different size potatoes here that I want to organize into different containers. So in this first box, I'm putting the really large russet potatoes and I'm going to use those for baking potatoes. And then in this second box here, I am putting kind of like the medium sized potatoes and in the large crate, the wooden crate, I am putting my smaller potatoes. I didn't have enough wooden crates to put all these potatoes in. So I'm using some cardboard boxes that I had and I don't fill them all the way full because I wanna be able to come down here throughout the fall and winter and kind of manage these potatoes and see if they're soft ones that need to be used up and I can grab those ones first. If I stack them too high, then what can happen is one toward the bottom or one that I don't see can go bad and then I don't notice it because it's buried and it can make a bunch of them go bad and I don't want that. So that's why I went ahead and used some cardboard boxes. Now I did go through the potatoes and I left the ones on these cardboard boxes that need to be used up first. So all the potatoes going into this bowl, I know these are ones that I'm gonna grab first and I already have plans for these potatoes. This week I am doing a week of crock pot meals again and three out of the five used potatoes. So I'm gonna be using these. That's one thing is when you know, you grow a garden, you learn to menu plan based on what you have instead of recipes you wanna try. And so it definitely makes you become a little bit more creative in the kitchen because, you know, you gotta to try to deal with the produce that needs to be used up right away. Now I'm gonna get these black beans. These are dried. Both the potatoes and black beans have been sitting down here for about two and a half weeks with a fan on them so that they can dry out totally and they will be ready for storage. Now these black beans, once I shell them, I will be canning them, but they could stay dried like this for years to come. I have some black beans that I had harvested from my last garden that are still perfectly dry and I could eat them, but I've been saving them for seed just in case for the last, since 2021. So it's pretty incredible that black beans can preserve themselves basically and they can be shelf stable for years to come with no other effort other than making sure they dry out properly. Now, why would I go through the effort of learning how to grow potatoes, black beans, and making homemade bagels 
when I could go to the store just as easily and buy a 20 pound bag of potatoes or black beans or a six pack of bagels? Well, it kind of comes down to the fact that I feel empowered when I learn these skills. I remember, like I was telling you when I was 12, I was blown away that you could actually make bagels at home. Now those bagels when I was young that I tried did not turn out well, but the bagels that we end up making today are absolutely delicious. And I just get the same when I learned how to cook a new recipe like pasta or gnocchi or something that seems so difficult and I learn that skill, I feel empowered by knowing that I have a new skill. And I get that same satisfaction of that empowerment feeling when I learn to grow new things as well. We got this project done. It always takes a little bit longer than I expect. So in this box, we have large, these two boxes, we have large russet potatoes. These two boxes, we have medium russet potatoes. This bowl are the potatoes that need to be eaten in the next few weeks. So those are my number ones. Well, not number ones in that they are number one, just <laughs> number one in line on the menu. And then down here we have our red large potatoes. I'm guessing that's probably 100-ish pounds of potatoes plus what we've already eaten, what I've already made into gnocchi. So that's more than enough potatoes for Josh and I for the year. I don't think these are gonna last down here longer than six months. So we need to be eating them, but I am super happy with the harvest. This took me longer than I expected. I've got my black beans. I'm gonna bring those upstairs, but I think we can shape our bagels now because I think it's probably been time for them to be shaped. This is my 30 quart stainless steel bowl filled with black beans. That is pretty incredible. So I'm gonna set this aside because I think our black beans, black beans, I think our bagels are ready to be, yes. They have doubled in size. I'm gonna wash my hands and we're gonna shape these bagels. So it says we need to lightly flour our surface, pull the dough out of the bowl. It's beautiful dough. I love the feel of dough. I don't know about you, but I just love it. And it says when the dough is ready, punch the dough down, release the air bubbles, divide the dough into eight equal pieces. Do not need to weigh it, just eyeball it. Okay. This dough is really nice, friend. Okay, so how I'm gonna do this, so I'm gonna cut it in half. I did not clean the counter. I knew that we were gonna be, you know, working with it again. So I figured I would go ahead and get the counter clean when we were all done. That's eight, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And then we need to shape these. So what I'm gonna to do to shape them is I'm gonna shape them how I usually shape my rolls. I don't need a ton of flour for this. I take my thumb and my pinky and I push down using the side of my hand and I twist it, I pull, I get a, a, I get a piece of the dough and I pull it and I roll it into a circle and that way I can get a nice ball and all of the gluten strands are in one piece, which is what you want. Now I have just watched videos on this when it comes to actually putting the hole in the bagel. I'm, I haven't done this. I think I did it a different way when I was younger and I attempted these. So this is brand new to me. So folding the dough in on itself. This one's a little bit bigger, I can already tell. She said in the recipe, I don't need to measure or weigh out. I think I'm gonna stick these on my lightly floured surface on the outside around here just so that they don't stick to each other or to the counter. So I'm gonna finish this process and get all these done. The other way I have seen how to shape the bagels is you take your piece of dough, you roll it into a snake, and then you bring those two ends together and then you have to roll the ends together so that the dough sticks on itself and you get a bagel shape, a, a basically like a donut where you've got the outside dough part and a hole in the center. Well, just from like watching videos and looking and seeing how that's done, 
I think that takes quite a bit more skill than the way I'm going to do it because if you don't completely get the two ends to seal together, then what can happen is when you put the bagels in the water to boil, then that can come undone and then you get basically like a breadstick instead of a bagel shape. So here I am just taking a couple pieces of dough on the bagels that I felt like were way too big and I'm trying to evenly <laughs> distribute the dough just so that they bake evenly in the oven and they're all the same size. So now we're gonna go ahead and put the holes in this dough. I just grabbed a cookie sheet with a piece of parchment paper on it. And now we have all of our dough into balls. We are going to put the holes into it. So I think what, what you do is you take your thumb and forefinger or middle finger. I think that's working. I think I need to get a little flour on my hands. And this is one thing I remember that I did not do a very good job at when I made these last time was actually getting the hole in the center. So if you have a really good ball, I think that's the key to have a really good ball, have it nice and tight at the bottom, take your thumb and middle finger, push them through the center, meet in the middle, and then just kind of push it out a little bit. But I do think the key is getting a really good initial shape on your dough first. Speaking from just doing this one other time, but the other bread experience I have, that's kind of what I'm drawing on, but no actual previous, well, one other time I've made bagels, so. They're starting to look like bagels. I need to get water on to boil. I probably should have done that first. I forgot about that, actually. So those look pretty good. We need to preheat the oven to 425 degrees. Let's see. And we need to fill a pot up with water. I'm gonna reread my recipe here. No, I did this correct. I was supposed to shape them and then prepare the water bath. To our water bath, we are gonna add a quarter cup of honey. And I'm just gonna eyeball this. That looks like about a quarter cup to me. We need this water to come to a boil. So I'm gonna put the lid on just so that that comes to a boil a little bit faster. That water is gonna take a second to come to a boil. So I'm going to grab another bowl and I'm gonna start processing these black beans. We ended up using that other bowl for the potatoes. So let's see here. So before we eat any of these black beans, they will thoroughly be washed. And we've got black beans. I need to get a third bowl for my garbage or compost. This is going to be quite the process getting all of this done here. So we're just gonna start. You have to be careful when you're doing this because what happens is black beans like to go flying. I'm gonna pick that up. I worked very hard for these black beans. I want every one possible. But beans like to hide in the very corners. Oh, see, here we go, just like that. That one. Now, just because I learn how to do a new skill and I get that confidence and that empowerment feeling, it does not mean that I then have to make that or grow that thing from here on out. Now, I love growing black beans. I don't know why, but there is something so enjoyable to me about growing dried beans, and I love digging potatoes. So growing beans and potatoes will probably always be in my repertoire of gardening just because the pure enjoyment that I get. Now, the bagels we make are incredible, so I probably will start making bagels more regularly, but just because I have the skill and the knowledge of how to make bagels does not mean that I'm probably gonna make bagels every time Josh and I want bagels. I will probably go to the store and purchase bagels. Same for something like a tortilla. We love homemade tortillas, 
but I do not always make homemade tortillas. But I love that I know how to make all these things so I can make them whenever I want. So our water is at a nice boil. We need to boil them for one minute each on each side. So I've got my bagels. I think I can fit four in here at a time, so we'll have to do this twice. I'm gonna set my timer for one minute. Once I cook the bagels for one minute, I'll flip them over and cook them for one minute on the other side. These ones have cooked on both sides, so I'm gonna go ahead and get them out of the boiling water. I do let the water come back up to a boil before I put the next round in, so I'm gonna get an egg wash ready. This recipe called to use only the egg white and a tablespoon of water, so I'm going to go ahead and give the egg yolk to my dog so they can enjoy that. And then now that the water's come up to somewhat of a boil again, I will get the next four bagels into the water. So what's happening when you boil bagels is it actually stops the cooking process of the outside of the bagel. It kills the yeast and it doesn't allow the bagel to expand once you put it into the oven. So the inside of the bagel will expand because the yeast is still alive and that's it like springs up when you put it in the oven, but that dough in the inside can't go anywhere. So that's what's gonna give you that signature chew that you want from a bagel. Now I think what I did the first time I made these when I was young is I overproved the dough. So I let the bagels rise for the second time too much. So when I put them into the boiling water, the bagels collapsed and they were dense and chewy and a kind of chewy you don't want. <laughs> and these, I didn't let them rise a ton after I shaped them. They only rose for about 15, 20 minutes. And then we boiled them and it kind of gave us this beautiful bagel. Now I'm gonna put everything but the bagel seasoning on four of them and then on the other four, I'm gonna leave them plain. You could get super creative with this. You could put some sliced jalapenos with cheddar cheese. You could do just sesame seeds. You could do really whatever kind of topping you want at this point. I am putting them in the oven at a 425 degree oven for about 22 to 25 minutes. I know that I am so late to the everything but the bagel seasoning trend. That's been going on for a few years now, I think since 2020 and I just have never bought it until recently, and it is so good. I totally understand the hype of the everything but the bagel seasoning. Josh really likes it too. Now when I make BLTs, even if it's not on a bagel, I've been sprinkling that on the sliced tomatoes, and it is so good. It just lends this really like garlicky, oniony crunch that is very satisfying. Now the bagels have been in the oven for about 24-ish minutes, and they are perfectly browned. The recipe, said, the recipe did say to make sure they're nice and browned. I'm gonna let them cool before we slice into them for dinner. So now we've got the hard part of dinner done. I already have some pre-made bacon, cooked bacon in my freezer. I love to keep bacon cooked in my freezer because then I can just pop it in the microwave or you could, if you don't use a microwave and you wanna keep pre-cooked bacon on hand, you could pop it in the air fryer for a few minutes. I only have to pop it in the microwave for about 30 seconds and then it's hot and I love having it as a convenience item in my freezer. So we got the bagels done. I'm gonna let these cool on this drying rack and we are going to switch gears and try another recipe I've never tried before. I want to get more adap adapted at making homemade donuts and this is the first homemade donut I'm gonna try. So. We are gonna make apple fritters because I have apples coming out my ears and I thought that this would be a fun way to get my feet wet in making homemade donuts. So a fritter is a type of donut that uses baking powder to fluff it up as opposed to a yeast donut. And so this I figured would be easier than trying to make a yeast donut first. There is a donut shop that's pretty famous in Portland that I grew up going to called Voodoo Donuts. And if I can get these apple fritters to turn out, I want to try to make or replicate one of their donuts. They have a banana fritter. I have never seen that anywhere else. The only type of fritter I've ever seen at a donut shop is an apple fritter. And a, the, their banana fritters, they're called Voodoo Donuts. Their banana fritters have chocolate on the top and peanut butter on the top, and they are so, Good, so I'm gonna try my hand at apple fritters first. Now these are organic apples from my orchard and some of them do have bug damage. So I do end up grabbing a third apple 
because one of them was pretty buggy and I didn't think that I was going to get enough apple between these two apples when once I took the bug damage off. Now this recipe I will link down below for you as well. I have very little experience with deep frying and they turned out really well, but I definitely need practice, practice, practice. I have a lot more experience to draw on when it comes to yeasted breads. So the bagels came a lot more naturally to me, but fried things don't come very natural because I have very little experience. So this is something that I want to build this skill. So I'm chopping these apples pretty finely. The recipe didn't say how big to chop them. They just said chop two peeled apples. And I didn't want huge chunks in my fritters, so I'm chopping them pretty small. And we are gonna make the batter in this stainless steel bowl once we have all these apples chopped up. The recipe said you can use Granny Smith apples or Honeycrisp apples. I don't know what kind of apples these are. These are just from my orchard and they were fine. I think you just want something that's not super, super tart or super, super, well, Granny Smiths are pretty tart and Apple Crisp are pretty sweet. So my guess is you could use whatever kind of apple you have on hand. Now that we've got the apples chopped, we're gonna make the batter. I'm gonna put one and a half cups of all-purpose flour into this bowl with a quarter cup of sugar, two teaspoons of baking powder, half teaspoon of salt, one and a half teaspoon cinnamon, third cup of milk, two eggs, and three tablespoons of applesauce, and then some salt. And I'm gonna mix this together. Now, I only had upstairs a very chunky salt. I didn't have a fine salt. I didn't feel like running downstairs again. And that was super delicious. Now I've used all my baking powder. There was something so yummy about biting into a chunky piece of salt with the sweetness of the batter. And that was just something that, you know, happened just because that's the salt I had on hand and I didn't feel like running downstairs. But it's something that I might attempt using in chocolate chip cookies next time I make brown butter chocolate chip cookies. I might consider using that chunky sea salt because I think the crunch and saltiness with the sweet of the brown butter and chocolate cookie would be delicious. So here I am going to grab my enamel covered cast iron shallow pan. I'm not gonna deep, deep fry these. I'm gonna fry them on each side in kind of a shallow fry. Now this pan is hot because it was in the 425 degree oven from when I was cooking the bagels. So I'm gonna get the heat turned on and I'm gonna put about a half an inch of oil. Now I'm using avocado oil, but you could use canola oil or vegetable oil or whatever kind of non-flavored high heat point oil you have on hand. And the recipe says to cook these at 375 degrees. My candy thermometer is probably not the best way to measure the temperature. So I had it at 325 degrees, but I think I fried these warmer than 325 degrees because I didn't have that much oil in the pan. It was a little difficult, I think, to get a proper reading on the oil. So I probably, next time I do this, should add more oil so that I can get a proper reading on the fritters. So I'm gonna put dollops of the fritter batter into the pan. It just said put dollops. I think what I should have done, and this is what I do with the second round, is I actually take the spoon and I flatten the fritter a little bit because I have a difficult time cooking the fritter all the way through. So I get them flipped over and then I realize they are turning way, way, way too brown before the inside is done. So what I ended up doing is turning the oven back on to 350 degrees. I brown the fritter on both sides and then I take the apple fritter and I throw it into the oven to finish cooking. So when I get the second round of fritters into the oil, what I end up doing is flattening out the fritters so they're not quite so thick. And I also turn the oil down a little bit so that I can try to get them cooked all the way through in the oil instead of having to put them in the oven. So here I have a little piece that I thought I would go ahead and give a try and it is so good. So they don't look like anything special that you would see at a donut shop, 
but for my first attempt, even though there are some hiccups in the process of making these, the flavor is still fantastic. So here I'm letting them just finish cooking on one side and then once browned, they will get popped into the oven to finish the cooking process. It takes about probably 10 minutes in the oven for them to get cooked all the way through. I could have just scrapped them and not put them in the oven. They would not have been very enjoyable because they still were pretty doughy in the middle and putting them in the oven was a great way to kind of salvage them. So here's the next attempt and I've got the batter and you can see how I'm flattening out the fritter batter so that it's not so thick. And my idea was that obviously if they're thinner, then they won't take quite as long to cook. So by the time they're browned, they would be cooked all the way through. And this helped a lot. I still put the second batch into the oven for about five minutes but they are no showstopper fritter, but they still tasted really delicious and practice makes progress. So I will attempt this again and see if I can get a fritter to turn out better. Because, you know, last time I made bagels, they turned out really, they were a big flop. And the second time I tried it, they, today on this day, they were perfect. And I will make bagels again for sure. So here I'm just checking the bottom to see if they are ready to flip. It did help to use two different spatulas or spoons in order to flip them. And then I did push them out a little bit after I flipped them to thin them out even more just so that they would cook all the way through, hopefully. So if you guys have any suggestions or recommendations on what I did or didn't do or what I could do in the future to make a better fritter, I would highly take your comments and really appreciate any tips or tricks. I learned so much from you guys in the comment section and I just really appreciate the fact that you all take a minute to kind of share your knowledge, not only with me, but with everybody else who gets to read the comments down in the comment section. There's so much knowledge that we all can share with each other and I just really enjoy being able to learn from you all. So here the apples fritters are out of the oven. I did put them on a paper towel and I'm going to sprinkle them with what my friend likes to call Arizona snow. So now I'm gonna give it a try. If you're wondering why I'm talking to you on voiceover, it's because my mic fell behind my apron and the sound was horrible. <laughs> so I'm just letting you know that we're gonna go ahead and try this fritter. It's still pretty hot and it is really, really delicious. It might not be the prettiest fritter. The texture could use some work, but even with all of that, it's still something that Josh and I were able to enjoy for a nice dessert. It wasn't too sweet either. That's what I really enjoyed about this recipe is it had a nice balance, especially with that crunchy salt. It was really, really good. Now we're gonna try our bagel with some of this cream cheese and see how well we did. Now I've already told you these bagels are delicious. They are phenomenal. But for Josh and I, when it comes to a good bagel, it all has to do with the texture of the bagel. You want that signature chew and this bagel delivered on that chew. So here is the inside. You can see the outside got cooked perfectly with the water bath and adding that honey allowed for the bagel to brown nicely, but it wasn't dried or crunchy or anything. You'll see when I take a bite that it's got this really, really nice chew to it. So good, so good, oh my goodness. So what I did for this bagel is I sliced up some garden fresh tomatoes from the garden. I got some bacon cooked up and we had some lettuce from the garden with just a little bit more of everything but the bagel seasoning. Here you can see what our dinner looked like. It was a delicious, easy dinner and we still have six bagels. We can have more bagel sandwiches for the next few days. I wanted to show you here, this is the black bean harvested. We got over eight pounds of black beans from one raised bed. I am so happy with the harvest. Thank you so much friend for being here as we got all these projects done today. If you enjoyed this, I can pop a couple of my other videos here. You can go enjoy between now and the next upload. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being you. And I can't wait to see you next time.